here in Romans chapter 8. We've been going through this wonderful passage that titled Living a Victorious Christian Life. And we find ourselves at the very end of the passage, verses 31 to 39. But as I understand, I know how to... So sometimes we don't know the will of the Lord. Most of the time we don't know the will of the Lord, for sure. And we always try to find the will of the Lord. Sometimes it's staring right in front of us, and we can't see it because we refuse to look at it. But, but I think I've, at least after much praying and searching, I understand the will of the Lord, which means His will is that we will have a hard lockdown at 11 o'clock today because there is load shedding. <laughs> So, so you're guaranteed that we will stop at 11 o'clock. I can, I can guarantee that is the will of the Lord today. I am trying to use my discernment as your pastor, so you follow me as I follow Christ, and we'll, we'll do that. Which means I don't think we're going to get through 31 to 39 today. And that's okay, because as we look into these verses here, as we've seen, we've had some I'd say some pretty good food as it comes to what God, through the Apostle Paul, has given us. Amen? And so we don't want to rush and then kind of casually walk by the table filled with all of its puddings and wonderful things like that. It's, oh, that would have been nice to have, and we'll just leave. No, we're going to take time to have that. That's why next week, our AGM, we're not going to let that interrupt, again, what we need from the Word because we are a church that believes in that and we'll use the AGM as a normal kind of a functional thing to tell you what's going on but it will not replace why we meet on Sundays. So we want to keep doing that. And so the purpose and, and with that which is great that the, the Lord is kind of uh, showing me that's we have to have the discipline to get through by 11. There are a number of verses we want to get through, and we'll just get through some of them here this morning. But these are very important. This is not just like a Bible study. Romans chapter 8 is intended for all young and old, new in Christ, seasoned in Christ, and we need this significantly. When we began, especially in Romans chapter 8, verse 28 to 30, which is a passage that we've just finished, something we hold on to, something we quote a lot when there's sadness, when there's difficulty, we immediately go to Romans 8, 28. We typically don't go to John 3, 16 then. We go to John 3, 16 when somebody says, what is this with you Christians? Oh, let me give you John 3, 16. But when someone loses a family member, someone has some type of a devastating loss, some type of a disappointment, immediately pull out. But we know that God works all things together for good to those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. And so we've spent at least two Sundays on that section. And that comes from the previous sections, which all talk about what it is to have no condemnation in Christ. And so we've just taken this section of Romans chapter 8. And what we learned in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, as we came in, and I gave some quotes there from Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, a preacher from the 1930s to the 60s. He said, our biggest trouble, humans, people, church members, is our ignorance of God, meaning we do not know God. That's a pretty big statement to make. Not that we're all in that way, but as we go through life, as we go through our difficulties in life, we tend to forget. Not that we never knew Him, it's that we forget who God is in a critical moment. And so we need to have that reinforced continually. There are two men in Scripture other than our Lord Jesus Christ. Now talk about this. Big impacts. The first, a man named Job. We read Job, it's difficult. Sometimes we don't want to, let's say, Pastor, don't, don't teach us, don't let go through Job. That's 42 chapters. We, we don't need that. And it's 42 chapters of which about 38 of them we don't understand. 
And I don't think no matter how much you try, we won't understand. So we just know about Job is, is really this anomaly given of a man who was righteous, upright in every way, and was stricken, allowed to be just brought to the depths by Satan. And God said, I want this to happen. We don't understand that. Well, as we go through the end of Job, in Job chapter 42, Job says, I have heard of you by my ear, but now I have seen you with my eye, and I repent in dust and ashes. Wow, Job learned something. He learned, especially in chapters 38 to 42, who is God? He learned a very important lesson, and it got a man through to the end who was suffering great, great pain and loss. But with that, what we just see is is God speaking to Job out of the whirlwind and, and, and basically saying, do you understand who's sovereign? You've been asking me for quite some time now to justify myself with your situation. But now let me ask you something. And he gives Job just a multitude of questions back to back. Where were you when I hung the sun, the moon, and the stars when the sons of God sang for joy? Do you know how the deer gives birth? Do you know how the lions get fed? Do you know how the ice is formed? And he goes on and on and says, you know, Job, this has been happening every single day that you've been alive and you've never asked me once. But only now when it comes to you and your situation, you demand I show up. Let me speak to you about who I am. Can you judge the righteous with your right hand? If so, come sit with me. Job learned who God was in his sovereignty. In his sovereignty. And I think the way we go through life, we listen to Job on that, and we see much of the Scripture. We say, yeah, God is in control, and he's sovereign for sure, but we don't know what to do with that other than say, yes, he is, and I'll keep going about my life, and I'll keep trying and striving to get what I want, but when eventually it's shown that no way will I get it, I just say, he's in sovereign and he's in control, and then I'll say it. That's why we're given the new covenant, and that's why we are given a second man in Scripture to tell us something about God that we need and we know we need and that man is the Apostle Paul and we learn this specific information that we need in Romans chapter 8 and and I want to just say this to begin before we read our text he starts off with what then shall we say to these things in verse 31 we're going there What then shall we say to these things? What does Paul mean when he says that? What things? Well, Romans 8.28 for sure. What do we say about Romans 8.28? Well, he's not just talking about Romans 8.28. I think we go back all the way to the book of, or to to Romans chapter 8. But all of these things about no condemnation. Oh, but we can't stop there. Because that is only part or the summation of Paul's argument. Because in Romans chapter 5, we have peace with God. And we go to Romans chapter 3 and talking about justification by faith. So how far back do we go, Pastor? Well, I think where we go back is Paul's ultimate declaration of what he found to be true. And this is how you understand the book of Romans right here. In the first 15 verses of the book of Romans... Paul is introducing himself as an apostle. He's introducing himself to this church he's never been to before. He said, I want to go with you. I, want, I would want to meet with you. I'm excited to share the gospel with you. He talks about what he wants to do. Ultimately, the, the letter is, is an introductory letter so that this church will support him as he goes up into Europe through Spain. And he wants this to be one of his supporting churches. That's what he says in Romans chapter 15. But as he's going through, he gives us Such an impactful statement. 
that will change your outlook on the entire book of Romans, where you think of it as just a difficult book. Lots of doctrine, teaching, words, long words. He tells us something that completely, radically changed the church so it shows that God will never let His church fall. The gates of Hades will never prevail against it. And God will never let His church go into heresy and go into just the depths of despair because of Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. Because a man named Martin Luther, who was a Catholic priest, who could never feel that he was forgiven enough as soon as he would go get forgiveness from his higher up, no, no, no sooner than he walked through the door, he'd turn around and come walking right back in again. Well, I just sinned again. Until they just got tired of him bothering them all the time, they said, why don't you just go read the Bible? I have the, the, Read, I don't know, read Romans. Just, that, that's a long book. That'll keep you a while. And as he did, he discovered something. We do not have to gain God's satisfaction because that's what the Roman Catholic Church taught. You can never be assured that you're saved and you must keep coming back for absolution. You must keep coming to the priest for, for confession and forgiveness. And there are all these rules that if you commit this kind of sin, you'll never be forgiven and that kind of sin, so many years in purgatory and so forth. And he understood in Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, Paul writes, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous shall live by faith. You see, Martin Luther was just, he was paralyzed in thinking the righteousness of God is revealed and I will never attain it. That's that's. Uh, too high a standard, unfair. God is to be feared because I can never get there and He is rightfully going to judge me. Until He understood and the power of the Holy Spirit came upon Him and illumined and, and He understood it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes for in it the righteousness of God is revealed in believers. The righteousness of God in what Christ has done has now been revealed to the earth. And that changed everything, and we are here today as a result of that. The power of God to reveal His righteousness. That's God's passion, God's heart. Now, why do I take you back to that? Well, if you look at what comes right after Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, it is the power of God to salvation. And the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written. And he quotes Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4 saying, and it was always there as well. Wow. Paul's on fire. The gospel is meaningful to him who was a Pharisee. He saw something different about God. God has a different heart. God isn't about going through all of the Le Levitical rules for a Jew so that the Gentiles would know better so that they would actually be under our feet. Now, that's not God's heart. He saw God's heart in Christ on that Damascus road. And he saw that this is the power of God. And how does, how, how does he demonstrate that it's the power of God? Look at Romans chapter 1, verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness and un, un, ungodliness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. And we go from Romans chapter 1, verse 18 to 32 to talk about how God gave them over. God gave them over. God gave them over to what? God gave them over in the lust of their hearts to impurity. And then he gave them over to a degrading passions. And then he gave them over to a depraved mind. One, two, and three. He just made it go worse and worse and worse. And he said, because it's demonstrated here, homosexuality is not going to bring God's judgment. It is God's judgment. That's what the scriptures teach into a way that you can never get out because your mind has been trapped and has descended into depravity of the utmost kind. 
going against all nature to where even, Paul writes, although they know the ordinance of God, they know God's law, those who practice such things are worthy of death. They understand that. They not only do the same, but also give hearty approval to those who practice them. And we think homosexuality is not the worst. I can think of something worse than that. How about people who say, hurry, let's get Jesus off the cross quickly before sundown. Otherwise, we might sin against Moses in Deuteronomy who said, he who hangs on a cross overnight is cursed. We'll be guilty of a sin of leaving a body on the cross overnight. Oh no, we want to honor God. Let's bring Jesus down after we've killed him. That's depravity. That's a pretty difficult situation. It's almost the most difficult situation that you can see. And why did Paul put it there? Because he's not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God to cut through his wrath like a hot knife through butter. The power of the gospel. He goes on to chapter 2 and say, you Jews who lift your nose up to heaven against the Gentiles and say, yeah, look at those people. He says, you who do the same and are hypocrites. Paul is a testimony to chapter 2. I was that guy. The power of the gospel can take us right through every sin, difficulty, judgment of God, everything. The gospel does this. And, and, and just before we get into this, I want you to understand, we, Christ Baptist Church members, we, the pastoral staff, need the gospel every day. It is not just to convert sinners, people under the wrath of God. It's not just for that. We need this every day. Why? Because we go out and are challenged by the world that's under the wrath of God and makes our rational thinking be challenged and we doubt. People have solid arguments, we think. My circumstances confuse me, like Job. What do I do? If you just think the gospel is to get you into heaven, you've missed everything. Everything. So Paul says, in Romans chapter 8, verse 31, he goes all the way back to his joy of writing this epistle. The gospel is the power of God. I'm not ashamed of it. It's the power of God for salvation. And the righteousness of God is revealed in it. What shall we say to these things? based on that going all the way to understanding Romans 8, 28 to 30. So I just want to get that in your mind as we now come to the last section, which is really knowing God. That's your biggest gain. You, if, you could, if you could know God more, and I want to show you how Paul is telling us about God, what do we need to know about God, and what do we need not to really know about God, Because you'll find that we are, in our human nature, we always pursue the things we shouldn't, and we don't pursue the things we should. And we learned that a bit last week. So let's get into it in the time we have left here. I wanted you to have that, because otherwise we just parachute into a verse or two and then say, wow, that was kind of cool. No. Follow with me. Romans chapter 8. We'll read 31 to 39. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? 
Just as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Jesus Christ our Lord. This is the reading of God's Word, and I just want to use this as a time to exhort you, but also to help you through a I would say it's a difficult letter, but it's a letter for people who think. As I told you, preaching is just not about giving you emotion and exhortation, but as Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones says, the business of preaching is to make you think and to think about God. And you think about God by His Word to understand His Word as we unpack what He has said. And now, basically, what are we going to be doing as we go through these really nine verses 31 to 39 it's what Romans 8 is all about how can I be sure of my eternal salvation as we've said before this is the main difference between the Protestant and the Roman Catholic Church Roman Catholic Church teaches you can never be sure that's why you have to keep going to the priest it's why they have to assess whether you've committed a mortal sin or a venial sin meaning a sin that just says there's nothing anybody on this earth can do about it, or a sin that says we, if you do these things, we'll, we'll be back on track. They talk about purgatory and all these kinds of things because you can never be sure. Christ has given you enough merit to get you to the place where you can begin asking for forgiveness, and then you work your way from there. What Martin Luther understood is it's past, present, and future, and you are sure, absolutely, with confidence. How can I be absolutely sure of my eternal salvation? And what we're going to see out of this is five rhetorical questions. Five rhetorical questions to ask yourself so that you will have unbreakable resolve with your eternal security. Five questions. When you find yourself during the week amongst people who are either unbelievers, maybe who are in a religious situation, but not Christian, not born again, Docu- uh, and, and conversation takes place. You begin to wonder about yourself. You begin to wonder about your sin because, see, that's why we need it. Not because other people convince us we're wrong. It's because I know what I've been like this week, and they're right to some degree because I know how I have not honored God. And therefore, I now begin to erode like the oceans pounding against the rocks erode my confidence that yes there is eternal security but just not for me i'm sure there are those here this morning who have that buried in them and it's starting to well up and it's part of my job to dig into your heart and say that's there let's get it out because eternal security i agree for those who deserve it but not me that's why we ask these questions here They're not your questions, by the way. They're Paul's questions. So you can be sure these are the questions Paul says you must ask these of yourself. So we know they're coming from God. Five rhetorical questions. Why does God want us to ask these? What does he want us to know? I'll just tell you where we're, we're going. God wants us to know his heart. That's why they're here. He he doesn't want you to know how he does what he does. He doesn't want you to know the rules of his judgment. He does not want you to know why he gives grace to some and not to others. He doesn't want you to to dissect that. That's not for you. As we said, the one question we can never answer from this pulpit, from Scripture, is why me? Why am I here? Why is my brother or sister who just rabidly rejects the gospel... Why do my parents, why do my children, why, do, why these people in my sphere where some come and others say, I mock, and still others say, we'll talk about this later. How can that be? I don't know. God doesn't answer that question in all of the pages of Scripture other than His grace to open the eyes of some. 
That's all we know. And we're going to see how he does that here this morning. Because we actually try to spend our time like little children fighting against their father to find out why God does something or how he might do something when he's saying all the time, here is my beating heart. Take a look and just drink from it and know it because you are made in my image. That's what I want you to fully know. Don't worry about the rest because I'm God. But I open this up to you so you can see it. And I want you to feel it and I want you to merge yourself in it. And we say, yeah, the heart thing, but what about this other stuff? And we wonder why we're frustrated and weakened every week. What is a rhetorical question? Well, here's, here's a simple rhetorical question. It means the answer is already there. We don't need to talk about it. Do fish swim? A common one. Is the Pope Catholic? That's kind of a common one there. <laughs> See, we, are, we don't need to answer that one, right? Here's one that every parent understands. This is treated as a rhetorical question by the children. However, the parent really needs it, children. So understand this. Young adults, children, you know, it's just, okay. There is an answer expected. It's not rhetorical, so get that switch. When your parent comes in and says, who did this? Okay, that's not rhetorical. Okay, that would be a real question. You're seeming, yeah, right. No, we all know nobody did. No, 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 somebody did this. So Paul's giving us rhetorical questions, which means the answer is obvious and it's right there. Now, to get there, let me just do a brief review because I want you to get this. In Romans chapter 8, 26, we talked about prayer. And Paul says in Romans chapter 8, 26, we do not know how to pray as we should, or we do not know what to pray for. And then verse 28, when we get to that Romans 8, 28 that we want to help him, and we know, notice that we are not to know exactly what to pray for about the future. But we do know something very clearly about our circumstances. Focus on that. Because when you don't know what to pray for, He tells us right away the Holy Spirit is there to help us. He helps us in our weakness, and He Himself intercedes for us. we got all the help we need. So just pray for what you believe is there and and, and don't worry about the future. Worry about your God. Because we know something. And we learned in Romans 28, 29, and 2 and 20, 29, I put these together for you. All things work together for good. What is that good? It's all to those who are called according to His purpose. So the good is His purpose for us. And what is his purpose for us? Verse 29 tells us to become conformed to the image of his son. That's God's purpose. So he reveals to us in scripture his purpose for your life. When you hear God loves you, has a wonderful plan for your life, this is the plan right here. It says so in scripture. You're going to be conformed to the image of his son. And as we learned, I'm just summarizing quickly, as we learned, the confirmation, that, that transformation that takes place is not so that you become more obedient, holy, and you know the scriptures like he does, and you walk around and, and, and you just don't care about things in life and you just preach. That's not what we're to look like. We are to become dependent on God as he was dependent on God. That's the transformation. Everywhere he went, he's like, I just think what the Father thinks, I speak with the Father, father says, I see what my father's doing, I join him. That's what he does. Now, you in your sinful state have come into the family of God, start doing that. And then he puts us on a path which is jobs, schooling, desires, and we walk that path. Paths of righteousness, Psalm 23. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. But he won't tell us what the path is. He puts us on it and he walks with us. Yet we spend our time not worrying about the plan and try to figure out the path. <laughs> That's pretty crazy, isn't it? He says, I got the path. Quit looking at it. Let's look at the plan. Start doing the plan. So don't worry about where you're going. Worry about the fact that you are becoming more dependent on God like Christ and things are going to be great. To become conformed to the image of a son. That is how all things work together for that. Not for your comfort on this earth.
But that doesn't mean God wants you to be uncomfortable. Now, why are we supposed to be conformed to the image of Christ? Well, so that He would become the firstborn among many brethren. That's what verse 29 says. Firstborn, prototokon, it means the firstborn son in a family. It means the most prominent form son of the family, not the first. And, and what are we talking about? And this is what I showed you, that Jesus Christ, who is the same essence of God, He's the same essence of God, is the first of God's children to come up and be with Him. But then we join, but we're not of the same essence. We're adopted. That's why we're different. But yet we're in the same family. That's how it can work. And because of Christ's death and His blood, He purchased us so that we can go in there. And we're adopted as Christians, brothers and sisters of Christ. Because why? He is the Son of Man as well as the Son of God. And we unite in that way. So we're not going to become like God, knowing good and evil. That, that was tried in the Garden of Eden and failed, eating the fruit. Jesus came, the second Adam, so that, no, you'll, you'll be like me, the Son of Man, Son of God, in the family of God. I welcome you in. But He's of the same essence, so He's the firstborn, the most prominent. And yet we are with Him. I can't define it anymore, so let's not try to get down into the micro levels of understanding the atoms of how this works. That's a heart, isn't it? A heart that God says, this is what I want. That's what we learned. And He puts us on a path, individual paths, so and we don't know what to pray for in that path. Holy Spirit, He sends to help us on that path, but He tells us the plan, which is, here's where you're going, do this, and man, is it going to work for you. That's what we learned, Romans 8, 28 to 30. And now we're in verse 31. First rhetorical question. I hope we get through two by 11 o'clock. The first, who can be against me? Who can be against me? What shall we say then to these things? Who can be against me? There's, there's the passage right there. Who's against us? Now, I think if Paul just asked the question, who's against us, and walked on, we'd say, whoa, whoa, whoa wait a minute, Paul. <laughs> Hang on, there's a lot. I can give you a long list. Matter of fact, the Bible gives us a list. Who can be against me? The world, the devil, and the flesh are against us. There's a lot of people in the world. I got my own issues with what my memories give me before I was saved. There's a lot here to give me. And then the devil and all of his demons. Who can be against me, Paul? A lot. All right? So don't just tell me, you know, who's against me? That's not going to help. There's a lot against me. All my workers are against me. The, the media is against me. The government is against me. And, and I've told people this. Every single government in the world is not your friend. Why? Because ultimately, at the end of the day, they will see Christ is in charge. They can't tolerate that. Some governments stop it immediately. I can think of various governments in Africa. Idi Amin, he stopped it way down there immediately. Don't like that. Other governments tolerate more and more until eventually you can see that the church is now kind of opposing their issues, and boom, they stop you right away. Others go a little bit longer, but ultimately, that's what's there. Every system, everything on television, every media enterprise is against you because you're with God, for sure. Not to mention all of the demonic forces that we know about that are moving and active in this world. They're against you. But that's not what he says. He adds something. <laughs> if God is for us, and that little word if there really is the word what? Since, because. God for us. Then who's against us? Well, the world, the flesh, the devil. Okay, anybody else? You want to get an idea of how God compares Himself to the world? Joel chapter 3, I believe it's verse 10. 
he gives the actual reverse of a verse that you know very well. You know Isaiah chapter 2, verse 4, because that is imprinted on a statue in the United Nations given by a Russian to the United States of America at the United Nations, and it says, they will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks, and they will learn war nevermore. Kind of a world peace kind of thing. Not realizing that that passage, that scripture says, world peace only when there's one king, one ruler. Go to Joel chapter 3, verse 10. He says, come, gather all of your strong men to the valley of Jehoshaphat. Come, gather everybody and beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Why? I want you to be the biggest, baddest, most well-armed army to come before me so you can learn your lesson. Bring it on, says God. If God is for me, who's against us? Well, I'll tell you one thing you don't want. You don't want God to be against you. Ezekiel 5.8, I, even I, am against you and will cause your enemies to just destroy you into the ground in front of others. I also want to read this to you. I, just, I keep this in the back of my mind <laughs> to understand about God when He's going to fulfill His purposes being against or for. Jeremiah chapter 37, verse 10, in seeing this, as he's trying to tell Zedekiah to give up, Babylon's coming. I want you to understand this. And he says this to the king of Israel. For even if you had defeated the entire army of the Chaldeans who were fighting against you, and there were only wounded men left among them, each man in his tent, they would rise up and burn this city with fire. Don't think you can win. When I'm against you, I will have people with one leg come and beat you. When God's against you, you got nothing. What is it when God's for you? What is it when God's for you? Because he says, since God is for me, since God is for me, what's the answer? What's the rhetorical answer? Well, as we understood Romans 8, 29 to 30, we didn't really cover this last time, but we talked about specific words here that were very critical. And it's a passage where everybody gets all wound up and excited about, oh no, those whom he foreknew, predestined, called, justified, glorified. This is when God's for you, okay? This is, this is all the people that God are for have to go through this. You cannot be God's people and not go through this. So if we want to fight about doctrine, we're understanding about the heart of God here. He's trying to say, I'm, I'm for you. And what we saw is the very first thing that God says in Romans chapter 8, 29, he's, he foreknew people, which means he what? He loved them. That's foreknow. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 20, he foreknew Christ before the foundation of the world. He loves you before you're born. Now, I'm not going to tell you why. I told you that. The Bible doesn't tell me that. No matter how many books I try to go find, no, one's been written, no, no word has been written on the answer to, well, then why did he foreknow people? I don't know. That's the mystery of God. That's him choosing to say, I will foreknow. And we showed how that's not knowing about people like they will believe later on in life. No. He's not talking about people here. He's talking about what he did. He foreknew, and, and we know this from Amos chapter 3, verse 2. You only, Israel, have I known. You only. But he's known about all the other nations, but only Israel has he known. So that's love right there. What comes after love? He predestines. See, he doesn't predestine first. That's, that's where people get the argument wrong, and they argue about predestination. God wouldn't do that. That's not fair. Well, because you don't understand predestination. People think that he just predestines people to heaven. That's a completely wrong argument. He does not predestine people to heaven. Now, ultimately, I know that's what happens, but the text here says he predestines them to become conformed to the image of his son. That is the word predestinate, predestiny. It means to give a destiny before you're even born. What's your path? He makes the path. What is that path? 
Well, it's actually the plan. What, what is that? It's to become conformed to the image of the Son. So when He loves you, He's already set the plan for you, which is you will become like your brother. That's predestination. You want to talk about guaranteed salvation? That's pretty much it right there. When He loves you first, you get a destiny. And then you are called. This is all what happens in the past. You are called. Called is being saved in time. It means the moment you believe here on earth. When that happened, you're called. Called to know the Son of God. You didn't know, though, that He has a destiny for you and that He loved you first. You're learning that. And you realize, I couldn't have done this on my own. God had to do this first. And now we see this wonderful doctrine that, wow, when He saved me, He's not saving me now and say, now, be obedient. See, that's Satan's lie. He saves you, and now you're supposed to be obedient. You better do that. And if you, if you aren't obedient, stop coming to church, doing things, you feel guilty, and maybe I'm not saved, maybe I didn't get saved, and I get confused with my Reformed doctrine or my Arminian doctrine, maybe I lost my salvation, maybe I never had it, and all those things Satan uses as tools to come after you because you're focused on obedience. I must obey, they must obey, we all must obey, and then we turn into Galatians. Nowhere do we hear that. God predestines you and then He calls you because He has set it for you and now you're there. And now I just want to find the heart of God because when He calls me and opens my eyes to the living God, He justifies me. When that happens, He does this, which is He immediately declares that you have never sinned. Because why? You're united with His Son, and His Son has never sinned, and you are together. He does that. And then Paul writes that you are also already glorified, because those two things come together, and this is the present and the future all together right there, while this is the past and that's the moment you believed. You are justified, which means you are on to glory. There is no losing your salvation. There is no I'm not a Christian. There is this is who you are. And God did all of those things. Now, if God is for us, what's anybody going to do? Just a couple of verses to show how God is for us. 1 Corinthians, no temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. God is faithful, who will what? He's not going to allow it. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. Will He allow you to be tempted? Yes. Beyond what you are able to do here yourself? No. God's for us. God's for us. There are people who have withstood concentration camps in World War II. But he always provides what? The way of escape so that you can bear it. You might die. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his godly ones. You see, this is for us. God for us. Even Jesus in John chapter 17, verses 15. I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. That's all Jesus asks of God for his people. Don't take them out of the world. Don't keep them out of trials, tribulations, all of those things. Why? Those are for their good. Those help conform their dependence on God. And they trust in you, God, that you will provide for them showers of blessing as needed. You'll provide their careers. You'll provide their health. You'll do those things. Jesus preached that in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 6. Why are you worried about what you eat and drink? Your heavenly Father feeds the animals because we think we're special, because we think we're equipped, and we think we're somehow not stewards and disobeying God when we say, but I'm not working as hard as I can and worry about what happened today, whether something's going to be there for me tomorrow. Jesus says, what are you doing? That's the path. God's got the path. Keep doing what you know to be doing. Keep using your skills to be doing what you're supposed to be doing. And trust the Lord. He'll provide for tomorrow. Meanwhile, are you being conformed? Jesus says, that's what we want. Trials and tribulations 
force you to prayer, force your dependence on God. They cause you to say, Father, I don't have the answer. He said, that's the answer I'm looking for. <laughs> when you tell me finally you don't have the answer. Great. Now we're where we want to be. I'm just going to focus here on being conformed. And Jesus says, I don't want you to take you out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. That would be too much. That would be too much. Peter, Peter, Satan has demanded to sift you like wheat. But I prayed for you. And when you return, when your faith is restored, go strengthen your brothers, which means Jesus already had the answer. Your faith is going to be restored. But this time of trial is going to teach you something. It's going to be very valuable later. Very valuable. I don't ask that you take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. That's what he says. I just want to give you this exhortation. We're only going to get to one point. But I hope we see the issue here. If God's for us, are you kidding? <laughs> I don't think that was the answer Paul was looking for, but I think it gets the point. Do you know, in the Old Testament, in the book of Isaiah, same question was given. Same issue was given. Where is God? Why would God do this? Oh no, the enemies are too much. And, and I just want to read this to you, and we'll close on that. But it's okay, we can take these as we go. It's important that we know them. Isaiah chapter 40. And just think to yourself as I read this. You've got your Bibles, you can go there. Isaiah chapter 40, beginning in verse 12. And you think of who can be against us? Who can actually infiltrate the mind, the soul, the spirit of a Christian? Who can do that and just create all kinds of, of nonsense? Doubt, failure, lack of, lack of joy even into heaven and realizing you just got the scraps, as Satan would put it. Isaiah writes in chapter 12, Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and marked off the heavens by the span? And